In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to build an international weather clock with the Raspberry Pi. A 16x2 LCD display will show the date and time, and a DHT22 sensor will be used to show the local temperature and humidity. Then the Python requests library will be used to retrieve and parse JSON, temperature, and weather conditions from around the world, and they'll also be displayed on the LCD. This will be a quick tutorial, but all the coded notes will be available free on my website, rototron.info, and a link will be placed in the description. I also have dedicated videos for just LCD displays and the DHT22 if you're interested. Here's a simplified schematic. The LCD display requires six GPIO pins on the Pi. You can pick any pins you like. I'm using GPIO 26 for RS, 19 for enable, and 13, 6, 5, and 11 for data 4 through 7 respectively. The LCD VCC is connected to 5 volts on the Pi. The ground, read write, and backlight cathode are connected to the Pi's ground. I received several questions regarding contrast and brightness, so I'll add two potentiometers to control contrast and brightness. The LCD contrast pin and the backlight anode pin are connected to wipers on the pots. The other two terminals on each pot are connected to a ground and a 5 volt pin. Please check your data sheet to ensure that your backlight will tolerate 5 volts. You might have to add a resistor if it requires a lower voltage. The circuit will include a DHT22 sensor, which will run at 3.3 volts, unlike the LCD display, which is 5 volts. The data line will be connected to GPIO4, and a mandatory 10K ohm pull-up resistor is placed between the DHT22 VCC pin 1 and the data pin 2. Pin 3 is left disconnected. On a small breadboard, I have a DHT22 sensor and a 16x2 LCD display. There's also a dual potentiometer in the middle, which I'll use to control the contrast and brightness. I'm using a Born 7102B dual pot, which I like because of the small form factor, and it also stays put on the breadboard. It's basically two potentiometers in a single dip package. First I'll connect one terminal from each pot to a 5 volt rail. Next I'll connect the other terminal from each pot to a ground rail. It doesn't matter which terminal you use for ground and which one you use for 5 volts. Switching them would just reverse the operation of the dial. Now I'll connect the LCD display contrast pin to the wiper of the left pot. The pot acts as a voltage divider. The dial will control the voltage, which will vary the display contrast. The second pot's wiper is connected to the LCD display backlight anode pin. This pot will now control the display's brightness. The LCD display ground is connected to a ground rail. The VCC is connected to a 5 volt rail. Make sure you ground the read write pin to ensure write only. You could potentially damage the Pi if you try to read a 5 volt pin. While the board is still relatively empty, I'll connect the LCD backlight cathode to ground. RS is connected to the Pi's GPIO 26. Enable is connected to GPIO 19. Data 4 is connected to GPIO 13. Data 5 is connected to GPIO 6. Data 6 is connected to GPIO 5. And Data 7 is connected to GPIO 11. Now I'll connect the 5 volt rails of the breadboard to a 5 volt pin on the Pi. And the ground rails of the breadboard are connected to a ground pin on the Pi. The DHT22 is going to run at 3.3 volts, so its VCC pin 1 is connected directly to a 3.3 volt pin on the Pi. The DHT22 data pin 2 is connected to GPIO 4 on the Pi. And the DHT22 ground pin 4 is connected to a ground rail. Finally, it's important to place a 10K resistor between the DHT22 VCC pin 1 and the data pin 2. Okay, we're done with the hardware. I have a fresh install of the latest Raspbian Jesse OS. I'll open a terminal and I'll run sudo apt-get update to update the list of available packages. After update, I run sudo apt-get upgrade to install the latest packages. I recommend you always start with an updated fresh install when you start a tutorial. This reduces the likelihood of conflicts and makes it easier to troubleshoot. Use cd to ensure you're in the home directory. Git clone is used to download the Adafruit Python libraries which has all sorts of useful code, including an excellent LCD display module. The code has been downloaded to a folder called Adafruit Raspberry Pi Python Code. I'll use Git again to download the Adafruit DHT22 library. This is a newer and better version than what's included in the previous download. The DHT22 code is in a new folder called Adafruit Python DHT. CD into the newly created folder. The Adafruit DHT22 library has two dependencies, Build Essentials, and Python Dev, which I'll make sure are installed with sudo apt get install. Afterwards, sudo python setup pi install is used to install the Adafruit DHT22 library. Once installed, the reboot is required. 
Forgetting to reboot after installation is a common mistake. After rebooting, I'll open a terminal and use GKSU to open idle with root privileges, which are usually necessary when working with the GPIO pins. In a new file after the shebang line, I'll import requests, which is a great library that simplifies interacting with web services. Sleep is imported from time, and date time is imported from date time to provide our clock with the date and time. Syspath append is used to ensure the Adafruit LCD library is in the current path. Another common problem that new users encounter is they can't import a downloaded library because it's not in the path. An easy way to make sure that you get the path correct is to use File Manager to locate the library file, which in this case is in the Adafruit car LCD folder. Then you just copy and paste the address from the File Manager into your append method. Now it's okay to import the Adafruit car LCD library. An LCD is instantiated. The GPL pins used to connect to the display are specified as parameters, RS26, E19, and 13, 6, 5, and 11 for data. The display is cleared, and the begin method is used to specify that this is a 16 by 2. Next, the Adafruit DHT22 library is imported as DHT. It's not necessary to append the path because the DHT22 installation program took care of adding it to the syspath for you. I'll paste in a list of tuples containing city names and their corresponding Yahoo weather IDs. The list is called cities. Next, I'll create a comma delimited string of just the city codes. Join is used with list comprehension to extract the codes. If you want to add additional cities and you need the ID codes, just open a browser and go to weather.yahoo.com. Search for the city you want. For example, let's search for New Orleans. In the address bar, there'll be a number next to the city name. This is the city ID. A method called getWeatherConditions will be used to pull Yahoo Weather. The URL is the address of the weather feed API. There are two query strings required. The first is query, which is basically a database query to return the weather forecasts for all cities in the provided city code string. This will be combined with the second query string, format, which tells the API to return the results in JSON format. Headers will also be added to make sure there's no server caching. I don't think the request library employs caching on the client by default, but Servers will sometimes cache data. This may not be necessary, but I'll throw it in just in case. The URL query strings and headers are passed to the request get method, which will return a response object. The JSON method is used on the data to return the response in JSON format. The response is already JSON, but this method parses it to a Python JSON dict. Try accept is used to catch and return any errors. Here's what the actual URL will look like when the HTTP request is sent. The domain? The first query string, which returns weather conditions for all the specified city IDs. The second query string, specifying JSON. I'll highlight the URL except for the JSON part and copy it. I'll paste the address into my internet browser. The results include the temps and forecasts for the specified cities. The format is XML because I omitted the JSON format query string. The return query object includes a count of returned items, a timestamp, and the language. A nested result contains channel, which contains an item, including weather condition, which is comprised of a code, another timestamp, the temperature, and the condition text. The last two are what we need. There are channels for each city. Let's try again, but this time I'll specify the JSON format, which will make it much easier for us to work with. As before, we have a query object with values for count, created, and language. Nested results, channel, item, and condition, which includes code, date, temp, and text. Again, the last two are what we're looking for. JSON objects in Python are represented as nested dictionaries. For example, in the Python shell, I'll create a dictionary of animals, which has a key birds and a single value of duck. Another key mammals, whose values is a list including cat and dog. Calling animals with the key mammals returns cat and dog. Let's create another dictionary of animal sounds. For birds, I'll add a nested dictionary entry where Duck is the key with the value of quack. The mammals list is converted to a dictionary with meow for cat and woof for dog. Calling animals sounds mammals dog returns woof. And cat returns meow. Birds duck returns quack. This is the same type of syntax we'll use to retrieve the nested values for temperature and condition from the Yahoo Weather JSON response. Back in the main program, here's the main while loop, which will run until interrupted. Get weather conditions is called. This is the function we created above. The return data is checked for errors. The data type should be a dictionary, and it should not contain any error messages. If there is an error, then it will be reported, and the program will pause for four seconds. If everything's OK, the total number of city forecasts returned is stored in a variable called count. This should be equal to the length of the city list. 
Note that we're accessing JSON data stored as a nested dictionary entry. This is much easier and more reliable than trying to parse a string or walk an XML file. A for loop is used to get the forecast data for each city. The city name corresponding to the city forecast is pulled from our city's list. Weather condition is retrieved from the JSON data, which is nested deep in the data. The query object contains results, which contains channel, which contains an array of items which corresponds to the cities. Each has the weather condition text and temperature. The first call gets text and another with the same syntax is used to get the temperature. This may seem convoluted, but this is a complex set and it only takes one line of code to extract deeply nested items. Next the display is cleared and the LCD message method is used to display the city name and temperature on the first line. I use the write 4 bits method to send a degree symbol, which on this display is 223. The higher number ASCII characters can vary on different displays and with different regions. Most display data sheets will provide a character map like this one. For the degree symbol, you find the higher bit values at the top of the column, which in this case is 1101. The lower bits are on the left of the row, which is 1111. This gives you a binary number 11011111, which is equal to 223 in decimal format. Next, an F for Fahrenheit and a slash N to switch to the bottom line, which will display the weather condition. The program will pause for a second, then it will get the temperature and humidity using the read-retry method for the DHT22 connected on GPIO4. By default, the DHT22 returns Celsius, so here's the formula to convert to Fahrenheit. The display is cleared and the date and time are displayed on the top line. STRF time is a powerful method to format date and time. The codes are not that intuitive, but you can look them up at strftime.org. Capital I is for 12 hour. Capital M is padded minute. Lowercase p is AM PM. Lowercase b is the abbreviated month name. And lowercase d is the padded day of the month. On the bottom line, the temperature is displayed followed by a degree symbol and an F for Fahrenheit. Humidity is also displayed as a percent. Sleep for two seconds and then the program repeats. On the display, we have the time and date with the indoor temperature and humidity. This will alternate with the temperature and conditions from around the world. Using a small screwdriver, the potentiometer on the right controls the brightness. Counterclockwise makes it darker and clockwise makes it brighter. The pot on the left controls the contrast. I hope you found this video helpful. You can support this channel by subscribing or leaving a like. Thanks for watching.